welcome again, everyone. We've been walking through as a church here with um, the book of First Samuel, and we're kind of like nearing the, the halfway point past that in the book. Um, maybe just to get started, why don't why aren't we that excited? What's wrong with you guys? What's wrong with us, right? No. Um, to get started, maybe we want to think about perspective. Perspective. So, in other words, how we see or perceive things, right? Uh, like last week, if you were here, and I know a lot of people here weren't here last week, so we'll try and catch everyone up too. Last week, we saw uh, the anointing of David when he was a young man. He was being anointed to be the future king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. And in this moment, Samuel's going to uh, Jesse, uh, sorry, David's family, his dad's name was Jesse, David's family, and he's told to anoint the one God picks. But Samuel doesn't know who God picks when he meets the family. So he sees the oldest brother, who's this big kind of like tough looking guy, soldier, and he goes, ah, surely this is the future king of Israel. Look at him. And God says, no, Samuel, that's not, that's not right. Don't look at his stature. Don't look at his appearance because I don't see what humans see. Right? People see what's on the outside, but God sees the heart. That's the lesson for us there. And we looked at assessing people, looking past the appearance, looking into the heart. What's really, kinda, what's really cool, I think, about for Samuel as, as a book is that the author foreshadows and recapitulates a lot of themes. So we kind of, as we move forward in the book, we kind of get to look back and, and see how it, it keeps coming in turn. We get to kind of revolve over these ideas and these, these lessons that God is trying to teach us. And as we step forward in our story today, it's kind of like that one phrase, that one sentence. No, the Lord does not see as humans see. Speaks really just as loudly in what we're going to look at today. And what we're going to look at today is arguably the most famous Old Testament story. Uh, that's the story of David versus Goliath. Got a few nodding heads, a few blank stares. That's okay. We'll go through it together. Um, yeah, David versus Goliath. And <clears throat> really what's, what's interesting about that is that, again, we see that the big issue is that of perspective. Well, we're not really looking at assessing people like we were last week. Now we see how we're supposed to assess our problems. Because as we're going to see, Goliath is a really big problem for the Israelite army. But first, let's um, get all on the same page a little bit about this issue of our problems. The difficulty with problems is that we all experience them differently. Right? Problems are really subjective, for sure. There are some problems that are objectively bigger than others. And we understand that, right? Uh, however, what might be still a very small problem to one person can be like a really traumatic or, or catastrophic moment for somebody else. And we have to really be careful with that, that we don't judge other people's problems by our own standards. There's, there's certain ways in which we're uniquely different in, in our hurt, in our pain. Right? We all have kind of different cracks in our souls, if you will. And I'm going to use the word trauma a little bit, and I, I'm going to use that word maybe a little bit liberally uh, than maybe some of us are used to. I think one way we can kind of see trauma is something that we aren't really even readily aware of. Right? We've all kind of gone through hurts and pains in our childhood that we don't necessarily know how badly it's affected us in our lives today. And these things are, are traumas. We maybe just don't perceive them quite the same way. And we all have different ones. Some of us have now grown up maybe with, with, with you know, struggles with relationships when we were young and, and the way we were raised, and that means that maybe we become like people pleasers today. We are like completely unwell in any moment when we're not getting the approval of maybe a certain particular people or just anyone in general. And it causes us deep pain and discomfort in our adult lives. Maybe other times our, our childhood, it's been, we, we lack that stability and structure in the home and now we cling to that in unhealthy ways with controlling everything around us, right? And so as soon as things kind of get out of hand, 
we break down at the most fundamental level. Or maybe, maybe for some of us, love was attached to our performance, our being good or doing good, and now we can't break away from this idea of judging ourselves based on how well we perform, which means those inevitable moments when we fail are absolutely life-crushing disasters. I'll give you a, maybe an, an example, uh, a little personal story of mine. For some of you, you're gonna probably roll your eyes and think, well, I'd have no problem there. One of my issues is, is with people pleasing. That's something that I struggle with. So I've worked a few jobs where kind of worked on the road. And when you're working on the road, you have a lot of leeway into you know, your hours uh, because no one's necessarily there to check. And I worked for one company where the policy, you'd say everyone who worked there thought it was unfair, that they were kind of cheated on their hours. So I was working with one guy and, and just getting to know them. I was new and obviously wanted to kind of have a good relationship with my, my coworkers. And it came at the end of the day and we're in the truck and he's gonna write the hours. He's like, I'm gonna give us an extra half an hour. And so automatically the discomfort, the unease, floods my system because on one hand we didn't work an extra half hour. Right? I'm blatantly lying and cheating if I say let's go for it. On the other hand I know where he's coming from because the policies are, are unfair. I know everyone else would be like yeah for sure let's do it. And I know in that moment to be a no man, like no we can't do that, could really create some friction in this perhaps new, possibly good relationship with my coworker. I'm gonna to have to work with them anyway. And so it's causing me a lot of stress and panic because for me, these are big issues. But that's my perspective. Maybe you relate to me, maybe you don't, but you have your own with those unique problems that are yours. What we can all get on the same page with though is that God's answer is the same for all of us. We need to put God first and adopt that proper perspective so that no matter what is our challenge, no matter what our problem is, we can still address it in the same way. So let's turn together then to, to Scripture, to 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at Israel's perspective problem when it comes to Goliath. So, I don't know, let's raise hands, get some interaction a little bit. We can raise hands, right? Who's familiar with the story of David and Goliath? Okay, good, just know how much I should paraphrase and how much I can't. So, if we've been tacking along with the book of 1 Samuel, Israel as a, as a nation, as a country, they have like this arch nemesis right now. And it's this group of people called the Philistines. All right, Philistines, the bad guys, Israelites, the good guys, very simply put, right? Now the Philistines are superior. They're the better fighting force better weapons, all that stuff. And we're at another pitched battle. We have the Israelites on one side, Philistines on another. It's like a ravine, if you can imagine your head, a dry riverbed in between. And they're both in battle formation across this riverbed. And neither one of them are making a move. That's the scene. And they're sitting there day after day. And no one's taking that first step. And then this giant comes along out of the Philistine camp. Is he's tired of waiting, and he sets a challenge to the Israelite army. Now, if we turn here, we'll pick it up there in chapter 17, verse 3. So the Philistines were standing on one hill. The Israelites were standing on another, with the ravine in between them. A champion named Goliath from Gath came out of the, from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet had bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelites, why do you come out of line, out, out to line up in battle formation, he asked them. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. 
If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. Really, we'll be your slaves. All right? But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our slaves and serve us. Then the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. And all of the Israelite army were terrified in their boots. And this happened repeatedly, day after day after day. And no one in the Israelite army could muster the courage to go out and fight this guy. And I don't think anyone here probably would either, me included, nine feet, nine inches tall, covered in bronze armor. He's got like a 15 pound point on the end of a massive spear of iron, which essentially is going to pierce anything that any armor of the Israelite camp has. This guy is nasty business. Let's look at David. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit with David's story. David, still a young man, he started kind of working a gig with, with, uh, in Saul's um, circles in his court, playing uh, his harp. And this is what he would do. He would go to Saul's court, as the, Saul was the king, and he'd play his harp, some nice music, spend some time there, then he'd go back to his dad's place and, and shepherd the sheep with his father. He kind of traveled between these two jobs that he had. And his three oldest brothers are in the army. So his dad one, goes to him and says, you know, bring some food, bring some supplies, you know, support the Israelite army, check in on your brothers. So David goes and does this. And he's up at the battle formation visiting his brothers when Goliath comes and makes another one of his challenges. And David is offended. David is deeply offended. Because Goliath is defying God. Defying God and defying God's people. This taunting, this challenge. And it's going unanswered, which is all the more aggravating. David's like, this guy has to be stopped. Somebody has to do something. We're God's people. We can't let this slight go. It's an offense against God. So David goes, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. So he goes to King Saul, and we jump ahead then to <clears throat> verse 32. So David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was young. And David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul proceeds to get, you know, get David geared up, you know, some armor on there, a sword, a helmet. David kind of goes and looks at himself and he says, no, this, this isn't right. This isn't what I had in mind. David's not a soldier, still a young man, still works with dad at home and plays, plays an instrument. He's not trained to move in this kind of equipment and to fight this way. And he knows that's not the point. So we jump in, in verse 40. He says, he said he took his staff, so his shepherd's staff, that long stick in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi, the, the dry riverbed, and put them in his pouch, his shepherd's bag. And then with his sling in his, his, sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Well, the Philistine came closer and closer to David, so now we're back at that battlefield and the duel is on the shield bearer is in front of him and when the philistine goliath looked and saw david he despised him because he was just a youth healthy and handsome he said to david am i a dog that you should come against me with sticks then he cursed david by his gods come here the philistine called to david i'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts and david said to the philistine you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. 
Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I will strike you down. I will remove your head and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israelite has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. When the Philistines started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and hit Goliath on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down into the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He overpowered him without a sword. And David ran and stood over him. He grabbed Goliath's sword, pulled it out of its sheath, and used it to kill him, and he cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines out. Pretty crazy. No one else in the camp of all these trained soldiers. And you have this little young man, this shepherd boy. Why do we think David was so courageous? Maybe it's just part of his, who he was. He's just really a, a bold guy. Better than the rest of us. Better than all the Israelites, because he's a bold guy. Sometimes we think of this story and we kind of think maybe it's just blind faith. He just knew that God was going to save his skin in this moment. And yet we don't really find any place in Scripture where God promises to keep us alive if we engage in you know, mortal combat with people either, right? We don't have that anywhere. Where's this faith coming from? No. It wasn't blind faith, and it's not some unique courage that is abnormal or unique to him is that David saw something differently. David had a different perspective. What we see in, in the preceding chapters is that David is called a man after God's own heart. He's a man after God's own heart. What that really means is that to David, even at this young age, basically God is the most important thing to him. God is the central of David's universe. He's the central of who David is. And because of that, he seeks in every way he can to do what would be pleasing to God, what God wants him to do. And in that as well, we see he gets a change of perspective. Because he's able to then live his life because he's central. He's like orbiting God. So every moment of David's life, he can see through this lens where he can see God's presence. He can see the way God sees things because he sees what God would want him to do, what God's will is, and he desires to live that out. We call it a God lens, at least for today think that's weird, it's fine. Call it a God lens for just today. It has a God lens. It's this unique perspective. And it doesn't seem like anyone else in the Israelite camp sees it, right? They have kind of this normal human perspective. And here's the normal human perspective. If we're all members of this Israelite army, this massive giant, this champion warrior comes forward to initiate a duel. There's kind of a, an understood way of approaching this. He comes with a spear, a javelin, a sword, dress in armor, demanding hand-to-hand -hand combat to decide the outcome of this battle. And in human normal terms and perspectives, the response is to meet him at his very challenge. Get your best fighter, sword, spear, javelin, dress him up in armor, send him out there, and may the best man win. That's the human perspective. And it's typical on the battlefield at this time. But David isn't seeing just this. He sees beyond this. He sees that spiritual perspective that God is showing him. Behind Goliath is a spiritual attack of darkness. On one hand, David sees it 
He sees that there is a spiritual attack against the Israelite army, the taunting, right? the challenge, the defiance. It erodes at the spiritual conviction of the army, their confidence and faith in God, their confidence and their faith and understanding of who they are as God's people. There is a spiritual attack at work, and there are spiritual forces at work. Because again, Israel, is, they're God's people. They have the truth of God's message of salvation for the world. And should the Philistines win and make Israel their slave, that witness of God's love and truth and salvation will be lost to the world. This is the greater spiritual reality of this very human battle. David sees this and he knows this. And he knows that God's will is to be with Israel and fight this. But he sees more as well. He knows that you don't have to play the cards you've been dealt when the evil when the evil one is the one dealing them for you. You follow with me? He knows that the biggest offense, offense that evil has is deception. It's lies. And there's a trick going on here. Goliath is saying, these are my terms. This is the battle I put before you. If we think in, in, spiritual, in the spiritual realm here, the darkness, the evil forces behind Goliath are saying, this is how you're going to fight on these terms. But David knows that God is sovereign, not the darkness. He knows God is the one who is in control. And he doesn't have to play the games that he is being fed. And because of that, he sees that he's not actually at a disadvantage. He actually has the advantage over Goliath. That's the trick of the story. David walks in there knowing that he's going to win. Because you see, David is a slinger. David's a slinger. We sometimes, I think, in the, the, the kind of the children's ministry version of the story, we kind of imagine like, you know, David with his little slingshot. You know, it's kind of this little toy almost, and he's just this boy going, I have faith, I'm going to go and, and win. It's not the kind of sling that we're talking about. David's killed lions and bears with this thing. The sling is an ancient weapon. There were whole, like, divisions of slingers in ancient armies. These are essentially the guns of the ancient world. And this is what David is trained in. Now imagine he has a gun in his hand and he goes up against Goliath. I think we see who has the advantage. And David sees this. He doesn't have to play the, at the challenge and play into the hand that Goliath and these dark forces want him to. No. God is sovereign. I can just imagine, I right, just imagine that Goliath sees David approaching from farther away. He sees the stick in his hand and he's laughing to himself. What are you coming at me with a stick? And I bet the moment that he realized that David pulls out a sling, within seconds he can spin it and fly that stone right into his head. As soon as he saw that sling, he was terrified. He knew he lost. It was a devastating advantage, and Goliath never stood a chance against him. And the rest of the army never saw this. Do we see our problems with this God lens that David saw? David saw right through this issue that stumped an entire army. They couldn't get around it. And as soon as you see the truth, it's like the lights go on. Why didn't we think of that? Do we see our problems with the same God lens today? <clears throat> the first step for us in doing that is knowing if we even have a relationship with God where we can even allow him, give him the access to us to have eyes that can see with these lenses. What I mean there is that 
We need to get right with God first. That's our first step. And we look to his son, Jesus, on the cross. Jesus came, he came down and lived our human life. Experienced all what we experienced, but he was also God. And he lived a life where he was completely in obedience to God's will. And he died on that cross, crucified, 2,000 years ago, as a sacrifice for all the ways in which we disobey God in our lives. He died so that we could have forgiveness. And when we trust in him and, his, and we have faith in that sacrifice as our own, we embark on a new relationship with God. You know, past forgiveness, we now have an opportunity to experience God's love, to experience his transforming power through his spirit. And once we're able to cross that bridge with him and to him, he now goes to work transforming our hearts, transforming our eyes so that we can see reality the way that David saw his reality. So if you're here today and you're, you don't count yourself as a believer, you don't really know much about maybe Christian faith or scripture, I want you to know that obviously wherever you're at, you can come and talk to us. That's what we're here for, to help you know, put the pieces together with you and walk with you in that journey. But I also want to challenge you, if you're here today and you do, you know, do count yourself as a believer, count yourself as having this type of relationship with God, sometimes we can fool ourselves. Sometimes we can fool ourselves because maybe we grew up in the church. Maybe we've been faithfully reading our Bible and praying, but we haven't really cut into the aspect where it becomes a relationship. We missed out on that part. Maybe we haven't really given over our hearts and our wills to God yet, despite maybe walking in the trappings of religion. Maybe that's you too. It starts with a prayer. It starts with going to him, God who is sovereign, that is in control, and asking him to guide us, to change us, to give us new hearts, to want and desire him more. And as we open ourselves up to him, we turn ourselves more to prayer and to the Bible, his word, his scripture to us. Because if we are going to have those eyes that can see, that God, that have the perspective that God wants us to have, we need to know about who God is. David, again, was a man after God's own heart. We put this in human terms. If you're after someone's heart, you darn well know who that person is and about them, so you can, you can do the job, right? It's the same thing with God. And he's available to us through prayer and through study of his word where we get to know who he is, what he expects of us, what are, what are the things he values. These are what we do. Back to my problem story a little bit. <clears throat> I'm sitting there. This guy's ready to write down what hour we quit. He wants to put it up ahead, half an hour, and I'm like sweating buckets a little bit, like churning on the inside. Like, I don't want to have a, you know, look you know, like a jerk or look like I'm self-righteous or, or something like that. I understand where he's coming from. I want to have a good relationship with him. For me, having disagreements with people is a really difficult thing because it feeds, steps right on that crack in my soul that I have and just twists and grinds and it hurts, you know? And it will last with me for like a very long time. But then I have two ways of seeing this situation. There's the human side. There's the human side, the peer pressure, let that affect me. Think that my value is somehow defined by how this guy sees me and maybe value that more than anything else. That's the human side, the human perspective. Then there's maybe taking a God lens, a God's perspective on this. First of all, what this person thinks about me doesn't matter. Because what God thinks about me is what matters. What God says about me, that's who defines me. Not this, not this moment even. It doesn't define me. And with that confidence and that security, I can ask, what am I supposed to do? 
This person knows that I'm a believer, so my actions go beyond even just me. And here's my challenge. If I can say no, we shouldn't do that and gently point out a better way or maybe a way to even say, even though it, the situation for us is unfair, but that's okay. We can be treated unfairly and still do the right thing. If I can show that perspective, maybe down the road, this guy's gonna remember it. And when he's going through hard times and he's facing his own problems, he's gonna know that there's someone who has a different way of seeing things. You're gonna stand out. Maybe that's what God is calling. Because in that moment, there is a spiritual battle going on. To either stand firm in the witness of Christ and show something different, show God's light in a moment where lying and deception could have taken precedence. Where are you at? Are you in that kind of person? We often try and fall back on where our value, where our identity comes from. Your value isn't based on how other people approve of you. Your value isn't based on how well you perform or how well you can control your environment or any of these things. Your problems are usually rooted in these issues. And as soon as we can get away from that, focus on who God says we are and have our confidence in him, make him central in our lives, just like David, we can look at our problems and see how we've just been playing into the hands of the devil. God gives us a way out. Sometimes that means we're going to be able to slow down and consider what God wants us to do. Sometimes that means we're going to have to endure a painful and discomfort, painful discomfort moments. We're going to have to suffer for a time. Sometimes we're going to have to wait in silence and in patience. But it's God is our rock. God is central in our lives to who we are. We have what we need to overcome. So we like to have a little challenge as we finish off for the week. And so here's my challenge for you this week, a little reflection challenge time. Something we like to, a phrase or kind of a mindset that we like to have here at Voyage Church is that of discipleship. We are disciples of Jesus, meaning we follow and pattern our lives based on his life and his teaching. This idea of discipleship is, is like a teacher relationship. Maybe a bit more like a coach in some ways, too, if you're sporty people, you know, you're like your coach. It's so easy for us to walk through our days and kind of forget about God. So our challenge is to try and get God back central in everything that we do. And I think a, a way that helps us do that is to imagine, well, it's not really imagining. You're going to imagine it, but it's actually a truth in that God is with us at every step. There is never a moment when we are alone. So I want you to imagine that Jesus your teacher, mentor, coach, whatever is kind of most similar to what you could kind of see with this, is with you at every moment and every action of your day. You will face big problems and you will face small problems in every one of these moments. You'll have interactions and temptations to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. It's not a temptation to do the right thing. But you'll have those temptations. I want you to vis visibly imagine that Jesus is with you, walking alongside you, kind of leading you through is like, as he sent out the disciples in the New Testament to go and, and practice, he's letting us do the same thing. So if we can do that as a church, I think that would be a good exercise. Just imagine that as you're walking through the day, interacting with people, facing challenges, problems, and stresses. Jesus is watching you. And you can turn to him and ask and say, hey, I don't know what to do here. Help me out. But be mindful of his presence and see how that helps to reformulate our daily interactions, all right? Let's bow our heads as we close in a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, I thank you so much just for who you are again, for your holy scripture that guides us so faithfully. It is, um, I really pray for all of us to have eyes that really see as you see, to have a perspective that is just influenced and created by you. I think it's really remarkable, God, just to see David's story and how he saw a way out of a problem that no one else saw because he was rooted firmly in you. 
because you were central to his life. And God, I know you, you have a way for all of us to get there too. Through Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you give us all that we need to develop this, to be transformed in your image, to see these things too. And I pray that for us, we would really cling to that first step of making you central to our lives. That we would be seekers after your own heart more than anything else. And that this would be the characteristic that we are known by. That everyone in our circles, friends, family, coworkers, would know that about each and every one of us as our defining characteristic and our defining trait. This is a work that you can do in us and we pray and ask for that in Christ's name. Amen.